Regardless of our worldview, we often feel like we don't belong to this world. Our societal structures and natural phenomena can be seen as intricate games. People often get lost in the seriousness of life becoming anxious and conventional, missing the underlying playfulness. This rigidity prevents society from accepting those who challenge or mock its norms, yet from a broader perspective, such seriousness can be admired for its depth, though it necessitates balanced individuals who stay connected to the essence of life, much like a guiding whisper in a play. This perspective extends to the concept of the cunning person, who, unlike those on spiritual quests that attract resistance, seek sudden unplanned enlightenment. This spontaneity is essential yet paradoxical, as planning for it defeats its purpose, realizing that spontaneity is inherent seen in our natural functions, like heartbeat and breath brings an understanding that presence is inescapable and life is always now. This leads to the realization that worry is unnecessary, transforming anxiety into laughter. Anxiety and laughter are two sides of the same coin. Both responses to life's oscillations, the choice is in interpretation, fear or joy, understanding that life is a continuous cycle of creation and destruction. Each event, part of an eternal dance, shifts our perspective from threats to opportunities. For joy recognizing this life's problems dissolve and existence becomes an experience to be embraced full of laughter, at its inherent likeness our social institutions and various forms of the natural world can be interpreted as games. It is important to emphasize that the word game here transcends the notion of triviality. It encompasses activities of meaning and value, such as playing a musical instrument when playing. We are not engaged in mere trivialities, but are participating in an activity that, although uncommitted in essence, carry sincerity. This perspective sheds light on the diversity of both human creations and natural manifestations, viewing them as authentic and autonomous expressions. Free from utilitarian motivations, therefore these games are best played when recognized as such. Although it is acceptable for people to take them seriously, they lose something by doing so when the Joker sees a person taking life too seriously and considering themselves of extreme importance, he finds it rather funny and tends to laugh. He knows that the intensity with which individuals take these games will be a counterpoint to the eventual burst of laughter when they realize that after all it wasn't that serious there are people who are very eccentric and very conventional usually we consider someone very eccentric when they are very unconventional but i propose that we view conventional people as the truly eccentric ones they are so involved in the seriousness of their games that they get lost don't know where they came from and despite their certainties and social positions are actually very anxious people. Our society demonstrates anxiety because it cannot allow the existence of people who do not fit in or who criticize and laugh at it. It cannot allow the presence of the traditional court jester. But from the Joker's point of view, there is no condemnation of these people. He congratulates them for their courage in getting so deeply lost to prevent the extremely involved from going mad. We need very centered people who maintain contact with the backstage like the whisper in a theater. These people are like the firm axis in a wheel-keeping society and existence moving the individual who sees social institutions as games, goes on to discuss another aspect of the Joker, the cunning man. Compared to the monk, the fakir, and the yogi, who in different ways commit to disciplines with the aim of freeing themselves from their karmic challenges, engagements and limitations but in each of these cases the individual provokes immense opposition because he announces to the devil so to speak that he is about to leave town then all the creditors appear at his door all his past sins catch up with him and the devil puts his most alluring temptations in his way the cunning man is the one who, when he decides to leave town, does so instantly, without any prior notice. This is what Zen calls the sudden school, and Satori is a sudden awakening, because it has to be done without the slightest warning. But then the problem arises, the moment you think of doing this, you are no longer seeking spiritual realization.
whether it's becoming a Buddha or achieving enlightenment, is already a notice to your creditors. So you find yourself in a paradoxical situation. You must act spontaneously, but you cannot plan this spontaneity. This leads to a kind of paralysis, where the very important thing to be done seems impossible to accomplish. It must happen, it really must, if you are sincerely in it, but it seems that you can. Do nothing actively or passively. However, as you start to see what you do all the time, you realize a curious fact. You cannot stop being spontaneous. Your heart beats. Your eyes have color. You breathe all without conscious planning. When you really reflect on this, you realize that there is nothing beyond the here and now. Even when you make plans for the future or remember the past, you do it in the present. Your memory is a present activity. There is no way not to be in the moment, not to have presence of mind upon discovering this. All that remains is to laugh. Anxiety and laughter are in fact the same phenomenon, but seen from different perspectives. Life is an oscillation, a constant vibration. The question is how you interpret this vibration as a tremor of fear or as laughter of joy. We talk about death as a joke, about the interpretation of painful experiences, and about how the meaning we attribute to them can transform pain into ecstasy. All this is to say that the anxiety, we feel the seriousness with which we take life, can suddenly turn into laughter when we realize that in the end, maybe there is nothing to worry about. This does not mean that we will not face painful experiences, but the way we interpret these. Experiences can completely change our experience of them. Even the process of torture taken to the extreme can transform pain into an almost transcendental experience where the usual meaning of destruction and end is lost life. The universe and everything else can be seen as a series of explosions and implosions, beginnings and ends that are eternal and cyclical. There is not a single cosmic event, but a continuous flow of creation and destruction. The idea that something happens only once is absurd. Everything that happens once can happen again. It is in this realization that lies the eternity of existence. The arising and disappearing are intrinsically linked. One cannot have one without the other. Just as one cannot have the crest of a wave without the valley. This is a game of perspectives, a matter of how we choose to see the world life can be seen as a series of threats or as a series of opportunities for laughter and joy. In the end, what transforms anxiety into laughter is the realization that despite all our worries, we really have nothing to worry about. When you come to this conclusion, life ceases to be a series of problems to be solved and becomes an experience to be fully lived a mystery to be embraced, returning. To the idea of the Joker, he exists at the point where the anxious interpretation of life transforms into the laughing interpretation. He sees death not as the termination, but as part of the great game. The great joke, death is not the tragic end, but a return to the starting point, a transition to a new form of being. It is the final laugh that unmasks the seriousness of life and reveals the lightness of simply being in this game, of existence. We are all at the same time actors and spectators. We are invited to take our roles seriously to fully engage in the plot of life, but also to recognize that in the end, it's all a game, a play in which we are part. The wise foreign people maintain contact with this underlying reality, reminding everyone that no matter how much we get involved, we must do so with a conscious gaze and lightness in the heart. This reminds us of the importance of living fully in the present, recognizing the ephemerality and eternity of our existence. It is an invitation to play the great game of life, not with fear or anxiety, but with joy, laughter, and a deep understanding that in the end it's all a great and wonderful joke. Facing life with this perspective changes everything. It transforms fear into courage, sadness into joy, and the ordinary into the extraordinary. It is a call to live authentically, deeply rooted in the present, always conscious of the eternal game unfolding before us. Consider the playful aspect of existence as a gateway to transcendence, in every social interaction, in every manifestation of nature. 
there is an opportunity to perceive the eternal game of creation. This view not only demystifies the seriousness with which we often face life, but also invites us to participate more consciously and joyfully. The recognition that we are immersed in a cosmic theater, where each act, thought, or feeling is a scene from a larger play, allow us to approach life with a likeness that is both liberating and deeply connective. Furthermore, understanding life as a game allows us to reinterpret our failures and successes. Instead of judging each action by the weight of its consequences, we can see them as moves on a larger board, learning and growing with each step. This perspective incites us to experiment to explore, and most importantly, to learn from the experience instead of fearing it. Life viewed as a game encourages us to be more adaptable, creative, and resilient, transforming obstacles into challenges to be overcome with ingenuity and spirit by embracing the game of life. We also open ourselves to synchronicity and the natural flow of events we recognize that we are not just playing, but are also pieces moved by a larger and more complex intelligence. This understanding places us in harmony with the rhythm of the universe allowing us to flow with its tides rather than fight against them. Synchronicity becomes a sign, a reminder that, although our role is active, we are also part of a larger dance, moved by the creative breath of the cosmos. It is important to also reflect on the cyclical nature of the game, just as in nature, where each season is an endless cycle of death and rebirth. Each phase of life leads us to new adventures, challenges, and revelations. Accepting the cyclical nature of existence helps us face changes with equanimity and recognize that each end is also a new beginning. This perception inspires us to live each moment with fullness, knowing that we are part of an eternal cycle of transformation and renewal. Have you ever thought about how most of the events we encounter are perceived as things that happen to us rather than originating from ourselves? These events are driven by some external power or activity which limits our understanding of ourselves. Even occurrences within our own bodies are categorized as things that happen to us, just like events in the outside world. Thunderstorms, earthquakes, hiccups, and belly rumbles are all examples of external forces acting upon us that we have no control over. We're not responsible for being born even either. And it's easy to spend our entire lives blaming our parents for putting us in this situation, this passive Perspective on life as something that happens to us influences our overall outlook in Western society. We often view human existence as a precarious event driven by a 19th-century philosophy of science that rejects religion. This perspective regards ourselves as biological accidents in a mechanical universe. Without any high purpose, those who are more traditional may see themselves as children of God and, therefore under divine authority, Regardless of our worldview, we often feel like we don't belong to this world. It's challenging for Westerners to consider the external world and our bodies as extensions of ourselves. Because we have such a limited view of what ourselves are, we tend to focus on specific areas of our experiences and define ourselves based on the those rather than recognizing our connection to the broader panorama of life. Let's suppose that before our birth, we existed as souls in another realm. During this time, we evaluated our options for various characters and roles we could play in life. We could see the skills, challenges, and missions that each character would have to overcome. Even before we selected our character, we knew how our life would play out. This selection process is critical as it enables us to level up and evolve as souls by learning lessons. Therefore, we carefully choose what we want to learn during our character's lifetime, as for you, selected to be you in this lifetime for the game of life. However, what's intriguing about this game is that we completely forget who we are and what we are, because we decided to have a human experience. Many people believe that they are human humans, but they are the ones controlling their characters. The true self is the one holding the controller. 
The purpose of our existence on earth is to participate in the game of life, where we choose our character and the lessons we will learn in order to evolve as souls. Many of us become so attached to this game that we miss the opportunities to learn, and as a result, we have to return to earth in multiple lifetimes, although we are meant to forget that we are playing a game. There comes a time when we awaken to this realization, and this is how we can successfully navigate the game of life. Once we recognize that life is just a game, we can change our perspective and start viewing our challenges as missions to complete. We can enjoy the life and even the pain. Just like we would in a video game at the beginning of the game, we don't possess all the necessary skills to win, and there is a learning curve we face challenges bosses and sometimes get lost but we seek guidance and continue on our journey likewise. In the game of life, we need to acknowledge that it is just a game and adjust our mindset to enjoy everything. The idea that changing your level of magnification can result in different perspectives. When you look at something through a microscope, the naked eye or a telescope, each perspective provides a different understanding of the same object. All perspectives are correct but they are simply different points of view. For instance, when you examine a newspaper photograph under a magnifying glass, you may see only a collection of dots, but if you step back, the dots arrange themselves into a pattern that makes sense. Similarly, our limited view of ourselves can make us appear senseless, but from a broader perspective, we may see a bigger picture that is not visible in our ordinary consciousness. When we look at our bloodstream under a microscope, we can see the conflict between microorganisms which can be fatal if we take sides. However, this conflict is necessary for the health of our organism. Conflict at one level of magnification may be harmony at a higher level. So our problems conflicts and neurosis may appear as a state of conflict at our level of magnification. However, a broader perspective may show us that it is a situation of harmony. According to some claims, certain individuals have achieved a state of consciousness where they perceive the apparent chaos and disorder of daily life as a manifestation of a larger whole that functions in complete harmony. However, this understanding relies on one's ability to overcome the illusion that space sep things such as the distance between birth and death. We tend to view these temporal and spatial intervals as insignificant, but they are essential components of the universe. For instance, stars cannot exist without space surrounding them, therefore bodies and the space surrounding them are interconnected and must be viewed as part of a single continuum. Life is a complex pattern that can only be understood by recognizing this connection activity. Our bodies are recognizable patterns that constantly change, and our only constant is the way we behave. We are all manifestations of the energy of the universe. Life is like a game of hide-and-seek. Take a moment to look at your hands and body and observe how you're currently controlling this human form. Remember that you are not the body, but rather it belongs to you. This is your character for this lifetime, and you have the power to change it to be anything you desire. You don't have to remain the same person tomorrow as you are today. The only thing stopping you are the beliefs you hold about your character. If you want to change your characters, minds start by meditating. You are in control of your reality. While others are playing their own games, you are the only thinker and creator of your game. It's as if we're all playing individual games within one big collective game, and we have the freedom to create and play it however we want. You hold the power to change what's going on inside your character, which in turn changes your outside game. The laws of the universe are always working. But as a character and creator, you have the ability to use and manipulate these laws to work in your favor. It's important to understand the power you hold. You are not just an ordinary being walking around, but a god playing the game of life. You are a piece of what created everything in existence, and your purpose on earth is to play with your energy and power. To create the game of life was specifically designed for you, and that is truly amazing to hear. We are playing a game, and we are playing by the following rules. We want to tell you what the rules are so that you'll know your way around, and when you get older, you may be able to invent better ones. 
we take a different approach, we still retain an attitude towards the child that he is on probation. He's not really a human being yet, but a candidate for humanity. From the beginning, we condition our children to a defective sense of identity. This conditioning sets up an insoluble life problem attended by constant frustration. As a result, this problem is perpetually postponed to the future. We live our lives always preparing for something yet to come. Never educated to live today. I'm not advocating for a heathenistic carpe diem philosophy where we neglect planning for the future. I'm saying that making plans for the future is useful only for those who are capable of living completely in the present. If you can't live in the present, you won't be able to enjoy the future you've planned because happiness will always consist of promises rather than immediate realizations. We need to understand that tomorrow never comes. It's always about enjoying the promise of a better future rather than experiencing it. That's why there are esoteric teachings, on the other hand, there is an opposite extreme, not realizing that the show is a show which is as bad as giving the show away. The whole universe wants a thrill, that's what it's all about. Otherwise it would be boring when you go to the movie, you know in your heart of hearts that it's only a movie, yet you contrive to, some degree, to forget this while you're there, allowing yourself to get scared and feel real creeps. Some people love to go and cry at tragedies because it's a catharsis. It gets all the salt out of you so you do this thing, and we can say it's vicarious. But that is the spirit of showmanship. And play, one might say, that it is possible in this life to attain a sort of metaphysical courage where you know really know deep within that the most harrowing experiences of physical existence are just a show. This is what you might call ultimate nerve. Don't hesitate. Don't be blocked or phased by the illusion. Remember the secret to all this is not to be afraid of fear when you can really allow yourself to be afraid and don't resist the experience of fear. You are truly beginning to master it. But when you refuse to be afraid, you are resisting fear, which sets up a vicious circle of being afraid of fear and being afraid of being afraid of fear and so on. That's what we call worry is simply a chronic condition. People who worry will find something to worry about. No matter what happens when one possible threat is exterminated, they immediately discover another because worry is like an infinitely skinned onion. You can go on and on peeling layers as you reduce the size of the onion and get your worry out about this or that. Suddenly, your sense of distance and size changes. You're looking so intently at this little onion that it fills your whole field of vision and becomes a big onion again. So if you are disposed to worry, there is always plenty to worry about. You might make plenty of money and have no financial troubles, then start worrying about getting a disease. The doctor says you're fine. Then you worry about getting into an accident. You take precautions. Then worry about political revolutions or your house being robbed. There's always something. This kind of worrying is a completely useless pursuit yet we feel a little guilty if we don't do it. We are conditioned to think that a proper amount of worrying shows a good sense of responsibility. However, concern doesn't have to mean worry. It can also mean amazement. Existence is extremely fascinating, but it's hard to articulate this feeling clearly. Imagine having an interview with the Lord God and being allowed to ask one question. You might ponder over and reject. Question after question, because none of them seem to get at what you really want to know. In the end, you might find you don't know what to ask. There is a sort of questioning, in your mind not so much a question as a feeling of wonder. It's all unbelievable, amazing, a miracle that there is anything at all. This feeling of the marvelous less of being is what I mean by ultimate concern. It's also connected to love in our abstractionist culture. We tend to obliterate fear and focus on controlling everything. But this approach is flawed. Trying to obliterate fear only strengthens it because you feel guilty. If you don't succeed or feel inadequate, fear arises naturally and spontaneously under certain circumstances just as you feel warm near a fire. It's natural to be afraid if you don't try to knock fear down, 
if you don't try to remake yourself into some preconceived idea of what you ought to be, then you're on the right track. Embrace fear and don't resist it. Only then can you begin to truly master it and live fully in the present, appreciating the thrill of existence as it is meant to be experienced. You see, you were fooled. You were always living for somewhere where you weren't. While it's tremendously useful to be able to look ahead in this way, there's no use planning for a future which, when it becomes the present, you won't be there. You'll be living in some other future that hasn't yet arrived. So in this way, one is never able to actually inherit and enjoy the fruits of one's actions. You can't live at all unless you can live fully now and because now is never satisfactory, because we're never really living in it. We become more and more avid to go ahead and pursue the future. We develop our technology to a fantastic degree, fulfilling our desires for the future almost immediately working towards a sort of push-button world. But have you ever stopped to think what the world would be like if you could fulfill every wish the moment you wished it? Suppose, for example, you go to bed at night and could always dream whatever you wanted to dream. What would happen after a while? At first... You might dream of fantastic pleasures and wonderful adventures fulfilling all your wishes, but as time went on, don't you think you'd want to be a little bit surprised to have a little less control over what was happening to you after you've experimented with this? For some months or years, you might even want dreams in which you suffer because there is no real delight, no real fulfillment without delay when we are not aware that certain things we take for granted like the separateness of each thing from another, are matters of convention, we are apt to be fooled, one, of the conventions by which we tend to be fooled more than almost any other is time for all human beings. Time is of extraordinary importance. Perhaps this is one of the principal ways we differ from animals. Humans have been called time-binding. Animals vividly aware that their life moves along a line from the past through the present into the future. Animals apparently live moment by moment and don't seem to have strong memories. But because humans have strong memories, they can bear the past in mind and cast it forward into visions of the future based on what has happened in the past. This ability gives humans extraordinary power to plan their lives and prepare PR for future eventualities, but it comes at a heavy price, especially if taken too seriously, if one doesn't realize that the true reality in which one lives is the present moment. Problems arise. We spend most of our time and emotional energy living in time that is not here in an elsewhere that is not concretely real, although we may be comfortable and happy in the present without a guarantee of a good future. We are unhappy. We develop chronic anxiety about time, wanting to ensure our future more and more. The future becomes more important than the present. When one realizes that the present is the only place in which you live and that the past and future are no more than useful delusions, you can settle into full participation in the momentary reality of life as it goes along. Buddha was called the Awakened One because he was completely here. He was all there, fully alive, in the present moment, our whole culture involved with time, and living for the future is nuts. It's not all here. We are not awake, not completely alive. Now, consequently, we are hungry and greedy because everything seems tasteless. We are living for an abstraction that has not yet come to be. We don't know what really is by letting go of the illusion of sheerness and a constant pursuit of future satisfaction. We can fully engage with the richness of the present. This awareness brings a likeness and a profound sense of wonder to our daily lives.